The following interview was conducted with Susan but, uh, Buckley Butler for the Purdue University Horror History Program. It took place on Thursday, March the 20th, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Susan is a member of the Board of Trustees. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and early years. Oh, siblings. Catherine, I'm so excited about being here. I mean, it's just like icing on the cake to be here and be interviewed by you with all your background and all the people that you've interviewed. It's, it's just a delight. Um, my background is I came from a small town called Abingdon, Illinois. I might say it's the number one city in the state of Illinois. People look at me kind of quizzically and I say, well, you know, if you look at the list of cities, you know, it's number one up there at the top because it's A, B. So I'm from the number one city in the state of Illinois. It's a town of about 3,500 people. Uh, very small, close to Galesburg, Illinois, which is where Knox College is. Carl Sandburg was born, the site of a Lincoln-Douglas debate, the uh, Amtrak train, previously the Zephyr, went right through Galesburg going out to the west coast. So we, tran we um, were on the trains a lot. Uh, in fact, we even had a, a depot in our little town of Illinois, I mean of Abingdon, but the only way we could get on the train was for the conductor to wave a flag to, so that they would stop, or the, the depot manager to wave a flag so the conductor would stop and pick us up. So that was kind of unique, being from a small town. Um, my family, uh, father and mother, um, and three, three children. Uh, I'm the baby, my, my, my brother uh, Dick is in the middle, and my sister Nancy was the firstborn. My parents were, um, my mother was from a farm, Mary Buckley, um, a, a very small farm, but she had a good upbringing there and married my dad, who was one of six children. And we all lived with my grandparents in this little town of 3,500 people. And in fact, we all lived around the same block with the exception of one family. So we would walk down to my grandparents for dinner on Sunday or Christmas or the holidays. Or, you know, we were one big happy family living around um, a, a, the block. And uh, a rather unique thing about Abingdon early in the early days was, you know, there weren't dial phones. And Ione was the oper telephone operator. So uh, my phone number was four. My gr grandmother's phone number was one eight, and, you know, somebody's was. 2-1, and I mean, those were, those were the days, and, and I remember one of my Purdue friends came to Abingdon uh, to visit and couldn't find me, and so he talked to the operator, and he said, well, do you know Susan Buckley? Oh, she's Ian says, sure, do you know what, you want to know where she is? You know, yeah, we'd like to contact her, so I don't know where I was, but she knew where I was or where I could be found, and so it was just that kind of an environment that I grew up in. My grandfather um, brought a, a, a company to town, uh, and we employed a lot, maybe a hundred people uh, of the of the uh, community there. And another unique thing is the first brick road that was put into this little town went from my grandfather's house over to the factory. Um, just a little tidbit. Um, and we were very, uh, kind of the, the family name in town. Uh, I think my grandfather was a mayor, my uncle was a mayor, you know, but we were all very community oriented. Uh, giving back to the community, it's probably where I started giving forward, I, I call it today, uh, to the next generation. But we were always there helping to make the community better. Grew up in the church there, the Methodist Church, and and uh, there was a library there that I was involved with in the high school. My high school class was one of probably less than a hundred. Um, but we had a, we had a great time, I always had a good football and basketball team and, and uh, Lots of things going on. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff. And then uh, what about college? Uh, tell us <clears throat> where well, you Well, it, it was interesting because my junior year in high school I decided that I wanted, I, here I, I charted out my career. I was going to go to college, learn how to become a buyer, and then I was going to go back to Galesburg, Illinois, and buy these two stores 
I had worked for this woman, Mrs. Manwarren, who was probably one of my first role models. And uh, for some reason, I mean, I didn't even know the stores were for sale. They probably weren't. But I was on, you know, I was on the road to come back to Galesburg and buy those two stores and then run them. So I was talking to um, a family friend whose, whose son went to Purdue. And I would, you know, walked in one Saturday morning for coffee. And, oh, I wasn't drinking coffee then, but they were. Um, and Bill said, well, Susan, you know, where are you going to go to school? And I said, oh, I don't know. I haven't decided. He said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, um, I really want to go learn how to be a buyer so I can come back and buy Marita Dales. And of course, they all knew who that was or what the store was. And, and Bill said, well, you know, Purdue's got the best home ec school in the United States. And I never really thought it. All I knew was I wasn't going to go to the University of Illinois. Uh, and I was going to go out of state. So um, I never thought anything more. You know, as a junior, I applied. Um, didn't have, you know, as I remember, I didn't have to take any tests, thank God, to get in. And, uh, and I was accepted. So I came over here to Purdue. With, I mean, I didn't, hadn't even seen it. Um, checked into X Hall, which is now Meredith, I believe. No, well, it's the ones that have the four wings, and they probably right. have four different names. I don't know. But anyway, I was in Northeast X, and uh, my roommate was Susan Alexander. So she was Susan A, and I was Susan B, when somebody called up and said, well, which Susan would you like to talk to? And, and even today, I mean, I was just with her last weekend, and we are just, after, she said, 47 years, uh, we're still very, very, very close friends. Um, so that's how I got to Purdue. Now, what year did you enter in? Purdue? I entered in 1965. Okay. Um, and uh, went to home at, went into the home ec school, and you know I'd had a lot of 4-H background and home ec in high school, and and I was having to take all these basic courses. I can remember saying, you know, I know how to thread a needle. I know how to sew. Why am I here? And um, and so fortunately, I started talking to some other people. I don't know exactly how I progressed, except that I, I had decided by the end of that year that home ec wasn't for me, that I was going to go into the Cranert School. And so I went to school that summer. I was here for summer school. Oh, is it hot here? Oh, terrible. But I met a nice guy while I was here. Um, and. Um, uh, then continued on in the business school then to get my degree. Actually, I got a, um, what did I get? Um, economics degree with a, ma with a minor in math. I always thought I probably should have been in math, and I investigated that, but math was in the engineering school at that time, so I would have gotten an engineering degree, which might have been nice. Uh, but it was also going to take me a fifth year to graduate because of the year I'd spent in home ec and I didn't have all the sequence sure. courses that I needed to have. Well, I decided it wasn't that important for me to take four or five years to get out of school, nor I didn't think my parents would pay for it. So I went into Cranert and got my uh, economics degree with a minor in math, which w was just fine for me, um, and proceeded to... Um, do great things while I was here at Purdue. One of the exciting things, as I look back on it, is the women that were in the Dean of Women's office at that time. I mean, it was phenomenal. And I didn't realize it, how, how different it would be. But, you know, there was Dean Schleeman and Dean Stone and Dean Cook and Dean Zissis and Danita Stobaugh. Uh, oh, and Babs Ellsbury. I mean, they were all there. You know, I was looking up to see all these women role models, but I didn't realize that it was different. You know, but that, it, there was it was both dean of women and dean of men at that time. Yes, there were, office, there right? were exactly. Right. right. And you know, so they all. I mean, I got to work with them. They were super, uh, and I'm still uh, very close to Barbara Cook. And in fact, I saw her just the, the other day. She's just a dear, dear lady. Okay. And um, where'd you live on campus? And did you stay in the dorm the whole no, time? No, I, I, um, I actually. Not my freshman year, but my sophomore year, I pledged in Alpha Z Delta, so mm -hmm. I, I was in the sorority house, okay. which I think is, was really a, also a very significant 
uh, experience for me. Uh, being in a women's dorm, then in the sorority house and working in, I was, I was um, involved with AWS, American Women's Society or something in those days, another women's organization. Right. And I think that that really got me going on the importance of women's networks and because I've been doing it all my life since then. Uh, but Were there many females in the Cranard School at that time? Oh no, I, I, in looking back, I think that um, there were five of us in, in, the, in, the, in our graduating class. Actually, I came here in 61, sorry, and I graduated from here in 65. But I think there were five women in our graduating class, and that was the first undergraduate graduating class that had women in it. Uh, but as always, I was probably, you know, the only woman in a lot of my classes. Uh, it was very rare that we would overlap. Right. Okay. Uh, but uh, Mart Fowler became a real, he, he was a professor, my transportation professor, and he was the on-campus kind of liaison between Arthur Anderson uh, in those days. Um, and and Purdue, the Craner School was the, particularly the MSIA program the master's program, uh, was a big supplier of recruits to Arthur Anderson. Um, while I was an undergraduate, plus they weren't interviewing women. Now, the whole recruiting process was very different uh, than it is today uh, in 1965. Um, when I went over, we would sign up for interviews, you know, this Arthur Anderson was coming in and you had to you sign up for a slot. Right. Well, I was told when I went over there that, um, we're sorry, Susan, but unless they say they'll interview women, you can't sign up. And I mean, that was, that was another eye opener for me because my sister was eight years older. She was a business uh, graduate from the University of Arizona. She had her CPA. You know, I mean, she was out in the business world, and so was my other cousin of, her, of the same age. You know, I mean, I didn't even think about it being a problem. Um, I don't know why, but I just didn't. Uh, so they I, were working and had gotten positions. Excuse me? They were working oh, and absolutely, gotten absolutely positions. Oh, absolutely, absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, so I had to write a letter to Arthur Anderson and ask them if they would please interview me when they were down here on campus. And so it was kind of late in the day, one Friday afternoon, you know, they called me in and said, we'll interview you. Um, didn't know whether they could hire me or not because they had to go talk to some of their clients to say, well, would you take an Arthur Anderson man in a skirt? And uh, fortunately, um, I did get a job offer. I had two job offers. Other people said, well, you've got great credentials, Susan, but we, wouldn't, we don't know what we would do with a woman you know, in our organization, other than in a secretarial position or something like that. And so I got an offer from IBM in West Virginia and Arthur Anderson in Chicago and took the, the opportunity to go to Arthur Anderson in okay. Chicago and start my career there. Did they have on-site visits at that time point? Did you go up there? Oh, no. Just no. on campus only? No, oh, on campus only. Um, I, I, I did get in, or, well, actually, I guess I'm wrong at that. I did go up for half a day. They didn't even buy me lunch. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, uh, I got up, I went up there for half a day, and uh, uh, two uh, graduates from the MSIA program did interview me up there, and I did, you know, talk to some of the other people around, but it, it wasn't a, a big deal. Okay. But right. the fact that I look back on it and think they didn't even take me to lunch, I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. Okay. Then for Sue, now in your career path with Arthur Anderson, most of that's where you want to make some comments and, and the growth and changes right. on that. Right. Well, do that. yes, I, I was the first woman hired by Arthur Anderson. Uh, people think, oh, that's un, un, unbelievable, um, first woman in Chicago. And I said, no, I was the first woman hired by Arthur Anderson. Um, their headquarters were in Chicago. That's where I went to work. Uh, so I, I was always on the consulting side or the computer side of the business. 
Um, it was rather unique because when I started, I was of the first class that didn't have to spend a busy season on the audit staff. There were times that I wished that I had done that just in order to understand that part of the business. But uh, I didn't have to do that. Uh, I learned computers by reading IBM manuals. Interesting thing is that I dropped my only computer course here on Purdue's campus. It was Fortran. Um, and was, we had these decks of cards, and um, it was just terrible. Plus, you had to spend your nights in the labs trying to get these bloody things. Well, I dropped to work. I, I, uh, I just uh, dropped the course. It, I didn't. I didn't like it. Didn't like the professor. You know, I just dropped the course. So I didn't know much about computers until I got to Arthur Anderson, and I spent probably the next. Well, I spent the next 38, 36 years of my life working with computers around them, you know, whatever. Um, but I became very, I was a, I say today that if the word geek were in the vocabulary in those days, I would have been a geek. Uh, I knew lots about computer assembly language programming. I knew the ins and outs about computers, et cetera. So, that's how I grew up, and uh, uh, I. The other, the second point that was really kind of unique about me was that, um, um, you know, I wasn't supposed to date people that worked in the. I wasn't supposed to fraternize with people that I worked with, either from the client's point of view or from Arthur Anderson's point of view. It just wasn't. It was one of those unwritten rules. Well, I, I again was the only person in a lot of my training courses, and I was sent down to the University of Illinois to an accounting course uh, in 1966, so it would have been the summer after I went to work, uh, an intermediate accounting course uh, to give the consulting people more experience with accounting and also to give people prepared to take the CPA exam if that's what they wanted to do. Well, I was the only woman. It was the first time they had uh, seated people alphabetically, so I was Susan Butler and, or Susan Buckley, and Dave Butler sat right next to me, only woman in the class. And um, so we kind of, you know, got to know one another and kind of snuck around, you know, with a date here and there. And we always ran into a faculty. Every time we were out together, we always ran into one of the faculty members. But anyway, um, things began to gel, and a few months later, we became engaged. Did he work for Arthur Anderson um, Yes, as he well? did. He worked okay. for Arthur Anderson uh, in Houston. And so, um, one of the, another, the third point is, I guess, that one of us had to leave. Uh, this, at that time, there were about 480 people worldwide working on the consulting side of Arthur Anderson. Now today, that's, um, I think we have 170,000. So it's grown quite a bit. Uh, but the consulting side. The consulting side, right, exactly. And so I had to, I mean, one of us had to leave uh, because I would be going to Houston, and the Houston office was pretty small, and it only had like 15 or 20 people on the consulting side, of which Dave was one. And so I didn't think anything about it. I thought, well, you know, okay, I'll leave. Just like I didn't think anything about changing my name. I mean, in those days, you know, when you got married, you changed your name. And uh, unfortunately, we were divorced about seven years later. And I thought, well, should I change it back? No. It, I, you know, that was kind of my professional name. But, you know, now I'm, I have really realized I'm really a Buckley. I mean, I grew up, I spent more years as a Buckley. Uh, so that's how I become Susan Buckley Butler now in my book is author Susan Buckley Butler. I brought it back into my name. But anyway, I, re I, I um, uh, resigned, went down to, we got married, went down to Houston. Uh, Dave was still working for the Arthur Anderson then. So I went to work for Humble Oil. And I was um, a computer liaison between the marketing person and the computer department. And, and Dave decided that he was going to leave Arthur Anderson and I wasn't that enamored with my job. 
Uh, I miss the people at Arthur Anderson and, and the work that we did. And so uh, after he left, I went back and interviewed them and I said, well, could I come back? I would really like to come back. And, and it, wasn't a, it wasn't an automatically, automatic kind of thing. I'm sure that they thought, well, so they've just gotten married, you know, Susan's going to want to have family and, and, you know, we don't know how long she's going to stay, but, but they let me come back and I, and I um, uh, developed, started my career there. Um, and it was really uh, an exciting thing to do. Um, and one of the, the things that happened that was kind of a negative was my first real you know, kind of slap in the face was I was up for manager, to be promoted to manager. And, um, and I didn't make it. And I thought, now, this is strange. Now, why is this a big surprise to me first? Should never have been a surprise. People should have made me aware of I, you know, what I needed to do. I wasn't taking control of my career. I wasn't saying, well, okay, I want to be a manager. What skills? do I need? What experiences do I need to get promoted? I wasn't doing that. And I thought that people were assigning me these jobs. They knew what I needed. They were, I thought they were assigning me to the right jobs to get me there. And I wasn't looking around at my peers to see what kinds of experiences they were getting and how different they were to mine. So it wasn't, it wasn't really a surprise after I realized all of this. After you thought it through. Anna. After I thought it through. Um, I had too much technical background and not enough business background to be promoted to manager in Houston. Um, so I got over that briefly. I mean, it took a while, but I got over it. It wasn't fun seeing my friends promoted, and I wasn't. But, you know, it's one of those things you live and learn with. Right. Um, and then Dave um, got transferred to Chicago. And uh, I went in and I said, well, you know, Dave's getting transferred to Chicago and I'd like to go back. And they said, well, Susan, um, we'll see what we can do, but it's a 50-50 chance that they'll take you back. And I, I mean, again, I thought, what? I just came from there. How could this be? Well, they had to have a position for me. I didn't understand that. But they had to have a position for me, and so that's why they were setting my expectations, that it was a 50-50 chance. Now, the unfortunate thing is, is yes, they would bring me back because they had a lot of technical work up there. I was a techie, you know, and they could put me right to work. And then fortunately for me, they said, you know, if Susan doesn't come up here as a manager, she's going to get lost, you know, and it'll take her a while to get promoted. So they were willing to, to um, turn over what Houston said, you know, they wouldn't promote me. Two months later, Chicago said they would promote me. So I did get promoted uh, in Chicago due to my transfer. Um, so it all worked out in the end. But I still had to figure out how I was going to get out of this technical role and get more the manager. Ma management experience, more business experience, so that I could become a business consultant, more out in the business side of a company rather than just in the technical side. I remember when I used to say, the only person I can really talk to is the vice president of, of uh, computers or information processing. And those are the people in the organization. I mean, I could. I could have any kind of a conversation with them, but okay. I go out to the marketing person, I wouldn't know what to say. Yeah. So I started you know, with a lot of technical jobs, and then I was out at Rand McNally, and I knew that I had to get out of the technical world. So we, were, we had a job come up in the customer service area that was computer-based, but it was out in the customer service area. So I, this was the first time that I really asked for what I wanted. I didn't realize it then as I look back. I, and I did. I asked for what I wanted. I went to Neil Doppelt, who is the partner on the job, and I said, Neil, I want to be the manager on that job. And there was the hums and haws, you know, well, can you do it? I said, 
put the right team around me. It's a technical job. Put the right business team around me. And we've got the best of both skills. And, and after a while, you know, I, it worked out. And the, the client person that I was working with was Shirley Manning, the first woman client that I had ever had. And she and I are still very close friends today, and we have a good time together remembering the old days at Rand McNally. But that was when I really got my foothold outside of the technology world and into the business world, and it kept uh, mushrooming from there. Uh, so I did a lot of projects like the, for Rand McNally and governments, and I did some work for the auditors because they were doing a lot of audit type work that included a computer. Um, and so then I was riding up in the elevator one day at, um, in the Arthur Anderson building and I was talking, I saw a friend that I hadn't seen for a long time and I said, Dick, what are you doing here? And he said, well, Harvey, who is the managing partner of all of Arthur Anderson at that time, said, says he really wants to get into the training business. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, all the training courses that we have out at St. Charles, you know, where we train our own, well, clients want, to, want those for their own people. And so Harvey thinks, you know, that's a good opportunity for us, a good business opportunity. And um, I said, oh, that's pretty exciting. And tell me more, you know, so I got really excited about this and, and um, I, I'm pretty futuristic. I mean, that's one of my strengths. And I thought, gee, here's an opportunity for me to be involved in creating a new business line for the company. For the company, right. <clears throat> you know, kind of an entrepreneurial um, aspect. And so I was talking to Dick about being on the team, and I was talking to my other friends, and they said, Susan, are you crazy? You're going to risk your career on that? Well, you know, I've learned to follow my gut. And my gut said, you know, one of the things that you do on a new computer system is you have to train the users on how to use the system. And I thought, now, if we did a better job on training the users, then we probably would have more success with the system going in. Because training the users was always an afterthought. And if we had some money left over to create the training programs, we would do it. But it wasn't a concerted effort. So that's how I was looking at it. And and so I was a part of that team, and little did I know that later I would be promoted to partner as a result of my experiences in developing this new line of business. But I, in fact, got it out of conducting our training courses, because that was a no-win solution, and, and got it crafted, the whole service line crafted into a more consulting practice where we would team up with the technologists who were installing these computer systems, but we would team up and do the people side of the business and get the people ready for, for the technology so that together it would be a success. And, and that's still a, a practice area today that is, I, I think it was a little before its time at that time, but we got it started and, and it's been a, a lifesaver. Very good. So we all know how important the people are in any business, and is it, when any change comes through, you have to change the people. Get them out of the old mode, old way of doing business, into the new way. So that's how I made partner, and little did I know that, you know, and I've talked about how important it is to know your, to have supporters and know the advocate, who your advocates are, and, and it wasn't until well, probably two or three years ago that I knew who my real advocate was to get me into the partnership. It was Bill Miller who was running what was then called the administrative services. This was the consulting side of the business. He was running the consulting side of the business and he had told the partners that I was working on that, you know, he wanted Susan in the partnership. Now, unfortunately, he had died by then and I couldn't thank him for all of that. But Bill was a great person, and uh, oh, of course I love him to death, and, and I'm, I'm really happy to know that he was an advocate for me. Sure, right. I can remember one day I was having lunch with him, and this was a point in time where I thought, just thought, I knew I had to have my MBA. 
So I, I was having lunch and I was standing up and we were walking back and I mean he was this tall, good looking, stately gentleman. And we were standing on the street corner and we were talking about my taking my vacation and getting into an executive MBA program at Northwestern. How I, you know, work on weekends and do whatever. And we were standing on the street corner, Bill was looking down for me at me and he said, Susan, you know, if we thought that it was important to have MBAs in the partnership or have people with their MBAs, one, we would only hire MBAs, or two, we would train you so that you got your MBA, you know, while you were working for us. But we're in, we're, we want to develop partners. And what I want you to do is I want you to take that time and put it towards developing yourself as a partner because you don't need an MBA to be a partner. Now, I wanted the MBA more for me, more as a credential, right. um, but I took him up on it. I mean, I didn't go get my MBA. Now, today, you know, I go over to the Craner School and participate in a program called Why an MBA? And I talk to the women about why it's important to get an MBA and when they ought to get it. Go out of school directly and get your MBA because the chances are of you getting it as you stay out longer go down dr dramatically. So I'm a big believer in people, you know, men and women getting their MBAs to support them. But I took his advice and went on and did what I needed to do to become a partner, which didn't include being an MBA. Mm -hmm. Well, and also I think you have to put it in the perspective of the times, and the times are, are, are different now, absolute, and uh, absolute, they'll right, be right, different in right. another 10 years. Right. So I think that's key. So there was another door that I opened here because I would then became the first woman partner in the Administrative Services Division, or what's now called the company called Accenture. Um, and that was great fun. I mean, we had a, I had a good time, uh, but I had a, a really good time helping the other women pull, you know, come up through the organization and, and see other partners being promoted. Uh, we'd go to our partners meeting. I was the only one, obviously, for a while. But then the women used to get together as there became more of us and have breakfast together. And so, you know, first there was one or two more then it was three or four more. And then one day we had the whole table full of women, which was just great, and we were making a statement. Right. Then we used to go out and have a women's night out at the partners meeting as we got more and more. And people would see us leaving and say, Susan, are you, are you, uh, what are you doing? Are you ready to uprise against the firm? And no, 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 no. We just want to get together. I mean, it was a way for us to bond it was this women's networking thing, sure, right. so we could help one another and, um, share. and share our experiences and, and be there for and one another. And that's a learning experience by the sharing. It's very key. Oh, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, what I also used to do was I would go around to many offices to conduct training programs and do one thing or another. And when I go to another office, I would go to the administrative person in the office and say, well, you know, I'd love to t go out to lunch with the women in your office if you would like, if, if that would be something you would like me to do. Because many of them never saw, didn't have a woman manager in the office, nor had they ever seen a partner that happened to be a woman. And so we'd go out and some women wouldn't come because the guys on their jobs would say, well, you know, we don't get invited out to have a men's lunch. And, of course, my answer to that is, well, they're at men's lunches all the time because they're always together. Uh, but some of these women, you know, wouldn't break out of the mold to come to the lunch. Others did, and it, and it was really an eye-opener. Uh, I, I would see them later, and they would all recount to me that day we had lunch. They would talk about what I wore, what I said. And I, I would, made an impression. I, yes, I made Being an impression, helpful. but I also showed them that I didn't have to be a man in a skirt, that I could still be a, a female. And I love being a female, and I love being treated like a woman. Um, I let people, you know, let open the door for me and go from the back of the elevator out first, and I let people carry my bags. I mean, you know, I love it. Right. <laughs> but I got a call. I said, you know, if you want to talk anytime, just call me. 
So I got a call one Saturday morning from this uh, young lady from the Seattle office. She said, Susan, you said I could call. And I said, sure. What, what do you want to talk about? And she says, well, I just found out I'm pregnant. What do I do? Because she didn't know. She thought she was going to lose her job. She didn't know who to talk to in the office. She didn't know what to do. And so fortunately, I was there as a, you know, an ear to listen and help give her some direction. And, and I got many calls like that because uh, they Good just resource. didn't have anybody to talk to. That's right. how I, I guess that's how I started mentoring women, which I've been doing for the rest right. of my life. They feel, you feel comfortable and there's that comfort level that, you know, people are very open and they have no hesitancy and there are, there are others like that, which Absolutely is great. Right. And, and that's why I wanted to go out and have lunch with them. So they would get to know me and feel comfortable. And if feel you want to call me, I'm really, I mean this sincerely, you're Absolutely. welcome to give me a call anytime. One of the great things about Arthur Anderson and the culture of Arthur Anderson was the open door policy. And, and you know, whoever you wanted to talk to, whenever you wanted to talk to, the door was always open. And people would stop what they were doing to take care of the people. And I think that was a really great thing that I got out of the Arthur Anderson culture. Right. And it permeated through your life, oh, lifestyle absolutely, too. Oh, absolutely right. right. Another big thing that was a, you know, it's so sad what happened to Arthur Anderson. I mean, it just breaks my heart because I started there. And it was a great, great, great company. Uh, one of the other things that I learned about was um, uh, making a contribution to your community. In those days, the Arthur Anderson office was dependent on the economic viability of the community. Because that's how we got paid. We were working with clients in that city, like St. Louis or Chicago or Detroit. And if it wasn't a vibrant city, you know, our office wasn't going to be successful and the people weren't going to have jobs and, you know, all of that. So we were, it was our responsibility to give back to the community for our having been there. I mean, we earned our, our, um, we earned our money there, but we were expected to give back, to make it a better place because we were there. And I talk about that today Every and I say, if you're not making a difference where you are, then you're wasting your time. You're investing your time somewhere. Make a difference with what you're doing. Good point. And right. uh, very critical as far as everything that I do. Right. Um, you were in Chicago, and then you moved to Houston. That's where you finally you got transferred to. Well, I, I was in oh. Chicago when I got married. I went to Houston. Then I went back to Chicago when Dave got transferred. That's when we got divorced, which was kind of a sad thing. Um, uh, and we're still very good friends, and when his mother was alive, I mean, we, I'm still very, very good friends with this whole family. Um, but it just wasn't working out. But the interesting thing was is that it was kind of a, um, an awareness thing for me, and it, I really kind of had to grow up because we'd gotten used to a pretty nice two-income family. And, and I suddenly realized, oh, Susan, now... What are you going to do? I mean, one income, you've got, you're used to two. You don't have anybody over here that's willing to contribute another check to you, you know, to get another double income, dual income. What are you going to do? So this is when it really, um, I really started focusing on the partnership and uh, uh, saying, well, maybe that's something. And I did this after two of the partners um, said to me, Susan, you can be a partner. And I never thought about it because I was down here and the partners were way up here. And, you know, I, I communicated with them, but, you know, I didn't really know any of them and they were older than I was, a lot old, to me, a lot older. Um, and so that put a new idea in my head. But the other thing that this did was it, it also showed to me the importance of having mentors. Uh, and mentor, again, mentor wasn't in my vocabulary those day, in those days, but thinking back about it, because mentors are those people that often see possibilities for you before you even see it. And I think back about Gail Hitchcock and Don McCubbery in the Detroit office they were the ones that said, Susan, you can be a partner. They saw me 
as someone that could be a partner. They helped plant that seed in my head, and then they said, and we'll help you get there. So that, again, I think was a formulation of my mentoring, how important mentors you are. You the value of it. Oh, absolutely. And how important it is to really take what others see about you and think about it and say, oh, what a possibility that is. So they planted the seed. Fortunately, you know, then I was on the road. I was, found myself in a position that was going to make me a partner, and I was promoted to partner. Very good. That's nice. It was pretty Let's, exciting. Yeah. Let's move on to the Purdue Connection. You've been pre involved in the President's Council when you were the past president, and now you're on the Board of Trustees. So you've really got some, and the women in, and the campaign for Purdue Steering Committee. Right. So it goes back to what I, you're I've saying. I've done a lot. I, I really, and, and I look back again to, and it all happened, I would say, when I got promoted to partner. And Dennis Widenauer saw a future for me here at Purdue. I mean, he also knew that I was on the, on the pathway up, and he saw lots of different futures for a lot of different reasons. But he did see that I could make a con contribution down here with my time and my resources. Uh, little did I know the resources I was going to be able to contribute down here in those days, but mostly it was my time at that point. And I can remember he called me up and said, Susan, we're going to be in, in New York. And I was living in New York then, and we'd love to have breakfast with you. Would you come in and have breakfast with us? And I thought, wow, I mean, I'm impressed. You know, because, I, I mean, those weren't the kinds of people that they were, I mean, I wasn't the kind of person that they were usually talking to, but wow, I'll have breakfast with sure. them. And little did I know where that breakfast would lead. But um, uh, Dennis had the idea of putting together the Cranert um, uh, School Alumni Association, KSAA. And, uh, and he wanted me to be a part of the Getting development it. of that, and I became the president of it. Uh, and it was a very exciting opportunity. And, and of course, Arthur Anderson in those days was happy for me to be down here because we were recruiting a lot of people down here. So it was twofold. It got me down here to help help Cranert, but it also helped the company in their recruiting process. So that was my start. Good old Dennis Widenauer seeing possibilities for me and, and, uh, and my saying, yes, I'll get on the team. So I went from KSAA to uh, the Dean's Advisory Council, uh, spent a lot of time, you know, helping, as I say, providing consulting hours to the Dean, uh, working on marketing and strategy and, you know, things like that, speaking to the students, getting involved. Um, uh, and then in 1999, I was honored by the Cranard School with my honorary doctorate. Complete surprise. Had no idea. Um, you got a, who'd you get a call from? The, pre the president called yeah. you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That would have been Dr. Be uh, Dr. Beering. Right. Right. It was. It was very, very, very exciting, and 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 a I nice think, and well deserved honor. Very well, nice. Now I yes, I'll say well deserved. Now <laughs> I'm not. I don't uh, pat myself on the back, but I I look back on that and say. Uh, and they and I've done well by them. Um, they they have many honors that I've I've uh, received because of my contributions at Cranert and 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 then the the first thing that I did from a development point of view was uh, decided that I was going to uh, you know support a woman student. Uh, what I yes, wanted sir. to do was was um, provide a scholarship to a woman out of state that was, would become somebody like me. I mean, it would be somebody that uh, wanted to get into Cranert, somebody that had leadership skills capabilities demonstrated coming in. They'd done that in high school. Uh, but they couldn't come to Purdue if it weren't for my scholarship. That, so I wanted it as a recruiting tool. Um, and so that's how it started in my um, first uh, um, scholarship was from Michelle King, who was from Sparta, Illinois, and she even says today, I would never have come to Purdue because of the cost. 
uh, if I hadn't had the scholarship. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, and then through the, I got on the steering camp, Dr. Bering's right. uh, campaign cabinet and, uh, um, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, my scholarship wasn't that big, but I did then uh, uh, develop that scholarship so that it's endowed. And, and annually, it, you can get it for four years if you meet the criteria of grades and ongoing leadership. So right now I am in my fourth, my fourth um, scholarship winner, which is pretty exciting. That is nice. To, and, I, and I get very close to the young women uh, when they're here and I'm still in contact with all of them. So. I think that's important that yeah. they, need, they need to know you know who it is and kind of interact right, and then right. you keep in touch all right, the time right. it, it means and it's very it's good exciting. from both sides it's very exciting so mm -hmm. I, I I got more involved you know with the campaign committee campaign steering committee and then uh, I think the next thing that came up was probably the president's council um, uh, president of the president's council right and uh, Carol and Gary you know got me uh, going on that uh, it was pretty exciting, and I was there in that position for two years, um, and uh, really, I thought, helped expand it, uh, increase the, the membership, increase the donations, uh, but it, it was great fun for me and met just lots and lots and lots of people, mm -hmm. and I continue to be on the advisory committee of the President's Council, yeah. so that's fun, too. Yeah. Um, and then, let's see, what next? The you got next, that, what's that Butler Chair and Learning Development Center? Oh, well, one? then I, I think then the next thing was probably my chair at Cranert. Um, and I didn't understand early on how important endowed chairs were. And so I think this was right at the beginning of the Jiski campaign. I'm just. I'm not sure. Time wise, you know, time around in that. Yeah, era. around that era, um, that they had some um, some money, some get, uh, contributors who um, had put up a lot of the money, like half of the money, but they weren't interested in having their name on the chair. So, if I would put up the other half of the money, then I could put my name on the chair. And so that's what I decided to do. That was my first endowed chairs because I understood then how important endowed, endowed chairs are to any school. And at that time, I mean, even today, I think we are way below our competitors in the numbers of endowed chairs that we have. And I, I know at the business school at that time, we were way below. So I wanted to get very sure. active and be a part of that. So. I think it was Rick Kozier by that time said, well, where do you want to endow the chair? And there was a finance option and there was an operations management option and maybe there was a third, I'm not sure. But I decided I wanted my name on the operations management uh, chair because that was very unlikely for a woman. You know, it was typical for a woman to be in finance, but, you know, I wanted a woman's name on a you know, very male-oriented career uh, um, area, and um, so that's what we did. And I'm very excited about uh, the people that have been in that chair. I, I really wanted a woman in that chair, but but uh, there there are not very many women in operations management. So uh, it'll it'll come. It just takes it, one it'll come right. And then following that, we got into the big Jisky campaign, and I wanted to do more and. Sally Mason and I were talking about the um, Discovery Learning Center and how exciting that was, and we both got very passionate about it. And, um, but I was also passionate about leadership. And so I wanted to start an institute that would be connected with the Discovery Learning Center. Um, and, and, and it turned out to be the Institute for Leadership Excellence. And, and I do have a chair there. So not only do we have the, the institute, but we have um, Beverly Cipher in that chair now and is do doing gangbuster things um, to help women, not only just in the university, but that's very important to me, getting more women on the tenure track and, and involved uh, in their careers and moving up the, the career chain. 
but but also hopefully at one day bringing women from outside in to um, learn more about leadership. I need to stop a minute. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, guys. <coughs> Just take your time. Yeah, remove about 12 minutes left on the Oh, wow. Okay, okay. If we run over, you'll put another one in then? Yeah. yeah okay. We can, they'll put another one there. Too. <coughs> That's okay. Take your time. Mm. <coughs> So Beverly's doing great things in, this, in the Institute, and ultimately what I want to do is think about bringing in people from the outside and helping develop women leaders in corporations um, that are looking and using at, the resources and the using the resources here. Yeah. And we're also uh, taking it to a different level in that we're using the Institute to support leadership for students and starting a, a program with Leadership, which is an outside organization, but it's a five-day program where we really immerse students, 50, 60 students at a time, talking about integrity, leadership and integrity, which to me is just a great, great thing. So we're off and running with the Institute, and uh, it's very exciting what's going on. Yeah. But then, but then we got into, and I thought I was done, you know, I. I was really done, I'd done enough, at least for now, until I heard Sammy Morse talking about the archives, the women's archives in the library. The night that we hosted the women of Purdue in, in the libraries, I mean, it was, you were there, it was an exciting thing. I had no idea what was going to happen that night. I mean, I was just there being a part of the program. And then I heard Sammy talk. and. And, you know, I had remembered the big Amelia Earhart exhibit that was here in the gallery there on the first floor of Stewart Center. I mean, it was a fabulous thing. I mean, to see all of Amelia Earhart's things right there and to walk around and see what people had said about her. And, and oh, I mean, it was just amazing. To, I mean, and I, of course, it probably sowed some seeds in my head that I didn't know. But then that night when Sammy was talking about the archives and the things that she had um, <clears throat> from other women um, at that time, I got so excited. And um, uh, <laughs> that night at dinner over at, at uh, Dean Mullen's home, um, my uh, financial advisor happened to be there. And I said, I know I'm not supposed to do anything more, but but I'd like to name the, the uh, women's archives. And, and, and she said, well, okay, we can do it. And so I talked to Dean uh, Mullins that night, and, and uh, I mean, this was so off the wall, it was unbelievable. Very much appreciated, oh, oh, great, it's But wonderful. it was very, very exciting, I mean, and it is just a, a an indication of what happens when your passion, you and know, you're, and you're really you. excited. You want to do oh, this. and I was so excited that night, and we we signed the deal. I mean, we didn't sign it, but we got the deal going that night. And Sammy was excited, and Judy was. Ex I mean, we were all very excited about right. the opportunity. And of course, today we've got our inaugural exhibit, including my cords. I haven't seen them yet, but including my senior cords in the exhibit um, to really. Um, get the thing up and running, which is yeah, great. Yeah, get it all up and running and celebrate what they're doing with it. So right, it's exciting. Yes. One of the things we were going to... Are you going to change the tape? Okay. Yeah. We're just asking one more question. Uh, well, I was going to uh, ask... Mentoring you talked about earlier, that was on the thing. And then um, the diversity certainly has been addressed in many of the comments as you, you really brought that to the fore. Right, I so, have. I'm a... You know, I talk about diversity as a, as a uh, big umbrella, but I really am focusing on women as a part of that. Right. And my whole passion now is to change the look and feel of all of our organizations, corporate America, the, the world that we play on, 
to get more women up into the senior ranks of right of corporations, to get more women CEOs, to get more women on boards of directors, um, and people of diverse, all diverse backgrounds, right. because we all come with different um, skills and capabilities. And if we would just take advantage of these skills and capabilities, I mean, what we could all do is far greater than what is done today with the majority uh, uh, being white males uh, with a single set of kinds of skills. Of course, they like you know, to hire people like themselves, but they don't see what the package could, be, could look like if, in fact, there were more people of diverse backgrounds in their leadership right. teams, and right. that's what I'm all about. Right. Hopefully, it's going to change before I leave this earth. That's my <laughs> goal. You want to change the tape, Brian? Uh, next, uh, talk a little bit about the Susan Buckley Butler Institute for the Development of Women Leaders at Tucson. Um, when I retired, I retired after 37 years at, at uh, what became Accenture. Uh, one of the most exciting things that I, I, part that I had in the growth of that firm was when the CEO, uh, George Shaheen at that time, uh, came to me and said, Susan, I'd like to have you come out and be the managing partner of the office of the CEO. And I had no idea what that was all about. It, uh, it just, you know, and in fact, I told him no. I, I loved what I was doing at the time, and I told him no. And somebody looked at me and said, you told the CEO no? And I said, well, I didn't think I had to tell him yes. Just, I mean, I knew him. He was a friend. And... Uh, I didn't think I had to tell him yes just because he was the CEO. Well, long story short, it was a mistake. And one of his friends, one of the people in his peer group called me up one day and said, Susan, did George call you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, what did he talk to you about? And I proceeded to tell him. And he said, what was your answer? And I said, well, John, you know, I love what I'm doing. And so I, you know, I didn't know exactly what that job was about. And, well, long story short, John convinced me that I had made a gross mistake, that I should have said yes. He convinced me that we were in arbitration at that time with Arthur Anderson. It was Anderson Consulting and Arbitration trying to split. And so we were in arbitration. He said, we're going to win the arbitration. You're going to be right at the seat of the CEO you know, helping create the new company, taking it public, um, making it, you know, a big company. And of course, that's not what I had in my head. I'd conjured up all sorts of different things, uh, but just by the fact of the title, you know, I'm right, not sure. right. I um, and so, so anyway, John convinced me. I did my Maya Copas and went out, and I said, George, I would love, love to do this job with you. So, long story short, George was, George said, well, two years, that's what I'd like to have, you know, for you, of time-wise, commitment. Well, he left in a year. So then um, an interim CEO came in. Well, he didn't know what a CEO was. He didn't know what was going on in the CEO office. So I, I um, hitched arms with him and everything we did, I mean, he had to do with me because he didn't know what to do, although he knew, I mean, he knew, but he really didn't know. And so when the new CEO was appointed, he said to Joe Forehand, well, Joe, you, couldn't, you can't get along. You've never been a CEO. You can't get along without Susan. And so again, I, I hitched my arm to Joe, and um, uh, we went through, I can't remember, three or four years together. Um, and we did win the arbitration. So I was there helping him through that process of winning the arbitration then the first thing we had to do was change our name because Arthur Anderson owned the name Anderson Consulting. So we had to change our name in five months, which was unheard of. Uh, we, we announced it on 010101. Uh, our new name was Accenture. And then in that spring, we created a corporation because we were going to do an IPO. We had to get all of these partnerships from around the world to agree to vote on becoming employees now, which was totally unheard of. Nobody really wanted to do it. 
But Joe convinced them that it was the right thing to do for the company. And so um, in August that year, we um, uh, went through an IPO and everybody said, oh, this is a horrible, horrible time. You shouldn't do it. We went ahead and did it. And thank God we did because right around the corner was um, September 11th. And had we not done it in August, I mean, it would have really been a bad time. And who knows what would have happened. Right. Very questionable. So that's what happened. Um, and then after I had done all of that, I retired after 36 years. And, and then people said, well, what are you going to do, Susan? And I, I had started writing my book. People had said, well, you need to write your book. So I had started that process, and it was going pretty well, but it was, it was hard. It was a hard thing to figure out what you wanted to write in your book. And so I had um, a dean of the business school, Mark Zupan, uh, at the University of Arizona, took me to lunch right after I had retired. And his question to me was, Susan, what is it that you want to say you've achieved in five years? And my first answer to him is, Mark, nobody asked me that question. I ask other people that question, but you know, you don't ask me that question because I didn't have an answer. But I started, I've learned about listening to your thoughts, how important it is to hear the thoughts that are going through your head. And by the end of that, in, end of that lunch, I was able to say, Mark, by the end of five years, I want to have impacted zillions of women and girls. I have no idea where that came from. I don't have any idea how many zillions are. But what that did was that got me to focus my time, which was my most important resource, my time on making that happen. Once I had committed to that, I was, I, right. I mean, he was, gonna, he was gonna ask me about it all the time if I, you know, if I didn't talk about it myself. Where are you? And so, you know, my book fit right into that. I started speaking trips. There were speaking engagements. Uh, things I was doing here at Purdue were women focused. Uh, I started, I mean, I, I had grown up mentoring women, so that was an easy thing for me to do. Good man. So it all sort of felt into, fell into place that this institute was the right thing for me to do. And I still love what I'm doing. And it's amazing, the stories that I get back about, oh, your newsletter, Susan, boy, it just hit me right on. I mean, it, this last one had to do with know your strengths, because I had just gone through a process of identifying what my strengths are. And, and uh, you know, and when people know me and I tell them what my strengths came through, they say, oh, uh, of course, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a futuristic person, I'm a strategic person, I'm an inclusive person, you know, I help develop people. I mean, that's me. And, uh, and so um, uh, this young lady said, you know, I had to take time to think about my strengths. And you know, I'm going to talk to all my people in my new department, and we're going to start focusing on everybody's strengths. So, so it's those kinds of things that keep me going all the time. And you make an impact. These are small things, but they're key things. That people one by don't... one, I'm making an impact. But right. then, you know, the other night, we had this Women's History Month event um, in Fowler Hall, which was so exciting because France Cordova was there, our new president. Um, the lieutenant governor uh, was there, Becky Skillman, Skillman right, sorry. Becky Skillman, and I was there. Three pretty powerful women talking to these young women about, you know, after, life after Purdue. All of my sorority sisters, my Alpha Z Delta sorority sisters were there. They came in in one big mass to hear me talk. And this was pretty exciting because last summer I had gotten the Alpha Z Delta Women of Distinction Award which my name is proposed by a student that graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I had gotten that honor based on her recommendations. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, offered, I'm looking at bigger opportunities like that. Um, next week in Atlanta, I'm talking to about 150 Alpha Z Delta young women, college kids, and 
Um, and then I'm going to talk to about 150 people, women alums from Georgia Tech. So that's when I'm getting the masses. Yeah. Uh, but that's I love nice. what I'm doing, and, and it's really, I'm not out of date. That's what I'm always concerned about because, you know, there's several generations, you know, between me and the students now. And when I find I'm out of date, I'll probably pull back. But I'm still, unfortunately, my stories are still right. important. Right. Yeah. One of the other awards that you got, uh, the Sagamore of the Wabash. Right. Yeah. How what did a, that come What about? an exciting thing. I mean, I again, it's one of those things that, that I didn't know about. Uh, who, who gave you the call? How did um, you find out about it? I, I think it was Carol and Gary. Uh, I'm I'm not sure, but or maybe it just happened one night at one of the events. Yes. It probably was a surprise. That was it. It was a it was a surprise. Um, so I didn't know anything about it, but it was because of all of my work here at Purdue that that was a significant honor uh, that was bestowed upon and me by the governor. And you can also tell people that they have a room named after you, which is in the Purdue Memorial Union. Oh, right. Oh, I guess right. I didn't. I hadn't put that together until right now. But the Sagamore. Oh my goodness, Catherine. See, you can build that onto that. I learn something new every day, but I hadn't really connected the dots there. Thank you for that. <laughs> and your membership, you've got quite a few, and you still are, keep pretty involved in that, and both here in Purdue. And that Fortune's Most Powerful Women Business Summits, that's kind of... Those were, those those were exciting days for me. Right, of course, right. um, my, business, my business back acumen isn't as significant as what I'm doing today, so I don't get invited to those kinds of things. But those were, again, those are women's networking opportunities sure. for me to get to know other women around the country, uh, around the world in some cases. Um, and uh, it, was, it was very exciting. The Committee of 200 that I'm uh, a member of, uh, it's more than 200 top women entrepreneurs, uh, but an exciting, uh, an exciting group, uh, Christy Hefner you know, is in that group. Uh, Lillian Vernon, who has her mail order catalog, is in that group. Um, the lady that runs the Tootsie Roll factory company is in that group. I mean, it's just exciting when you get these women get together, together and super. talk and share stories and, and really help one another. I mean, there are many times that I've called upon these women yeah. to uh, help me. Uh, and and a key person that is in my life today helped do the research on the Committee of 200 to see if there were 200 women that would fit the criteria, Karen Page. Karen Page is a dear friend of mine now, part of my team. I say that to be successful, I, you have to have an aspiration, you have to have a team to help you, you have to have a plan, and then you have to navigate it every day. That's my make it happen model, which is in my book. Well. Karen, Karen helped me write my book, and she is a real mentor of mine and I of hers. Um, and, and in fact, she's coming. She and her husband are coming to be keynote address uh, to give the delivery delivery of a keynote address at the black tie dinner coming up in a couple of weeks that the uh, hospitality and tourism group do, do do every year. Do every year, and they have a new book out: What You Drink with What You Eat. And it's everything from milk and water and beer and, and all the way up to wine with what you eat. And uh, they're talking about their book. And it happens to be dedicated to me, Great. which is so exciting. But, but it's, they're on my team, and I'm on their team. Um, it's, it's really exciting. And you never know where you're going to find these right. women and, and them have a, a touch one way or another. So you have to keep reaching out. Oh, and, and taking advantage of opportunities. That's right, exactly. Uh, how about a favorite memory of, of Purdue? Got one? Oh, you know, or, or I have. There are so many memories of Purdue. I mean, and I've. Uh, <clears throat> if I if I you know go back to Dean Widenour, who got me started. Uh, before that, Mark Fowler, who got me started at Arthur Anderson. Um, you know, Dean Beering and Jane. All of the memories that Jane has provided with taking pictures everywhere, and you'd always get a Christmas card from them with a picture of you in it. So I have a lot of memories of, of Jane and Steve. Uh, and then came Martin and Patty, and became very uh, integrated with them as a team, helping them 
developed the preeminence of Purdue and taking Purdue to another level. Uh, that was very exciting. Um, and now, you know, being on the board of trustees and getting that call from Mitch Daniels, I mean, I mean, that was a surprise. I, you know, I had always wanted to be, that was one of my goals, to always be, you know, you think about aspirations, well, I'd done a lot, but that was kind of my ultimate aspiration, was, was to um, um, be on the board of trustees. And, and I tried one way and it didn't work, and so I'd kind of said, well, you know, maybe it's not to happen. And so I'd kind of, you know, in, in my mind written it off until, you know, Mitch Daniels called and I was floored because here I was in Tucson, Arizona, so far away, and he was asking me to be a part of the board of directors or board of trustees. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thank, I mean, surprise and a big, a big thank you to him for reaching out to me. Uh, and, and that led me on, to be on the search committee for our new president after you know, Jiski decided right. that he was going to um, retire. And uh, so I was on the search, selected to be on the search committee to bring, you know, our current president in, Dr. France Cordova, uh, which was just an exciting, exciting opportunity. And um, I, I look back on that and say, wow, what an experience. And, and now to be a part of, 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 presidency, of right. this new presidency and being a part of helping her take Purdue global in a big way, I hope, right? Uh, and to bring us local in a big way, you know, with, with our engagement activities, with bringing more research, you know, into, the, into Purdue and, and solving more of the world's problems here. I mean, it's very exciting the opportunities that are available. And I'm just loving every minute of being involved. I love it so much that I just bought a condominium here. You know, and I, I, well, I'll be I dropping, love, I know, love right. my condominium here, looking right down on the Wabash River. And over uh, during the winter, I can see all this, the lights from the university. And I mean, it's, it's wonderful. So mm. couldn't have a better life. Good point. And uh, how about some closing comments? Anything that you'd like to say? Well, I just, every time I, I, well, I talk to audiences and tonight, you know, I just thank people for, for being involved wherever they are, for the contributions that they're making, for the difference they're making. I talked to young women today and other women to say, what's the legacy you want to leave? And in my book, Become the CEO of You, Inc., which talks about my Make It Happen model, but it also Believe it or not, I've written my eulogy. And that's kind of grim. But the idea is, if you think about the legacy, or if you think about what you want to have people say about you when you pass on, now you've got time to make it happen. So that's my whole story, to have people think about who they want to be, not who somebody has said, oh, you ought to be this, or you ought to be that or somebody gives you this to-do list, but who do you want to be? What are the dreams, as Eleanor Roosevelt says, what are the dreams that you want to follow? And go make it happen. Make it happen for yourself, because if you don't follow your dreams, if you don't follow who it is you want to be, then I say, well, who have you outsourced it to? Who's out there that is going to make it like they want you to be, rather than how you want to be? So. Those are, I guess those are my parting comments, is to take care of yourself, be the CEO of who it is you want to be, but be careful that in accepting that role as CEO, one, you have to take responsibility for you. So you use my model, who do you want to be, who's on your team because you can't do it by yourself, who's the plan, what's the plan, and how are you going to get there every day and you've got to spend time on yourself. How many times do we worry about everybody else, but we never worry about Catherine, or we never worry about Susan? We're always taking care of everybody. Why is it that our time on our calendar, we can't say gym time, exercise time, and feel comfortable about saying, I'm doing it for me? 
because that's what we need to do. We need to take care of ourselves as well as everybody so else. So that we can also perform better. It has to be both ways. Absolutely right. 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 But we were raised by our parents, you know, and we saw them taking care of people all the time. That's mm -hmm. why we do it. Right. But I'm trying to get people to spend a little time on themselves to be the CEO and be who it is to achieve the dreams you want to achieve. Good. Thank you very much, Susan. I very good. This concludes the interview with Susan Butler. Thank you very much.